ooh, the glove compartments, check it out. And I love how these things pop up like that. It's a safety feature instead of coming down. And inside, what have we got? Ooh -hoo. Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1967 Imperial Crown four-door hardtop. And of the 17,614 Imperials built in 1967, about half, or 9,415, were four-door hardtops like this one here. But something important about the Imperial for 1967 was the fact that it was no longer body on frame, like it had been in 66 all the way back to the 20s, but rather it was semi-unitized construction. And to learn more about that, let's pop the hood. But before we do that, check this out. The grill on this is not plastic. This is metal. I mean, that is old school. As they say, they don't make them like they used to. Now, the styling on this was done by Elwood Engel, who replaced Virgil Exner around 1962 or three. Now, Elwood Engel, of course, was the man responsible for the Lincoln Continental, or Continental of 1961, which won awards for its reserve and subtlety. Of course, Virgil Exner brought Chrysler back from the brink <clears throat> with fins and forward look styling, but uh, it went a little crazy. So <clears throat> Virgil Exner was out, Elwood Engel was in, and this is the result of that style. So getting back to semi-unitized construction, somebody has so conveniently removed the 440 for us, we can better see it. What looked like frame rails going under the firewall actually ends under the front seat. Uh, and the firewall all the way to the taillights, that is a structure that is basically has its own rear frame. It's semi-unitized, uh, kind of like a 67 Firebird or Camaro has a bolt-on subframe. So too does the 67 Up Imperial. Now here's the thing, 66 Imperials were body on frame, but the rest of the full-size Chrysler line went semi-unitized like this in 1960. So what Chrysler kind of did was they brought Imperial a little down in the expense department so that they can compete better with Cadillac. Now here's the thing, this car new was $5,863, which was 250 bucks more than a Cadillac uh, Calais Sedan DeVille. So Chrysler was always fighting an uphill battle, but they sure tried their hardest. Now this would have had a 440 way back when, but we can see somebody razor sawed this thing out of here, unceremoniously ripped it out that in its torque flight. This would have been a 350 horsepower 440 with a good close chamber heads for 1967, 915, Things. People with GTXs love those heads, 67 only. Uh, 1968 would have brought the optional 370 horsepower a TNT 440 with dual exhaust, but for 1967 these were strictly single exhaust, 350 horse, 440s. Plenty of power to get down the road. Now this is the power brakes, which of course were standard on Imperial, but this is kind of cool. It says here, perfect circle on that. It's into this aluminum casting. I usually think a perfect circle with piston rings. Well, this is the mechanical cruise control and all these Morse cables that feed it from transmission and engine to basically have a mechanical computer inside of this thing, then operate the accelerator and transmission kick down to, uh, to follow your whims in terms of cruising on the highway or whatever it might be. So again, cruise control was an option and again perfect circle was the subcontractor that designed and built these things for Chrysler Corporation so let's go around uh, what exactly is a hard top well this is kind of an interesting design most of the time when you see four doors you're gonna see a full frame and the window goes up and down big old B pillar not here check this out you open this door and you can look inside and that's kind of nice it's got a big interior but if we open the back door we'll see well, look at that. There's no B pillar. In fact, the side pillar is truncated right there, just enough to hold the hinge. So the idea with this is that with the windows down, all the way down, you've got a wide open airy experience without the obstructions of uh, the door frames or this B pillar. Now I gotta say, this is the days before side impact protection and the lack of a full pillar here eh, might not be the strongest thing on the planet. But again, you know, Detroit was still finding its feet uh, when it was designing vehicles. Now on this one here, it's kind of cool. This is Motor Trend Magazine right here. And this is uh, November 1966, previewing the 67s right here. Motor Trend, by the way, one of the great things, they've never made a mistake with one exception, canceling Roadkill's Junkyard Gold, just saying that. Uh, anyway, but inside, <coughs> we get into this, and here is the test of the Imperial. And we can see here, 
Most important change in the 1967 Imperial is that it is now shares Chrysler's unit body chassis in a stretched out version. Imperial no longer uses separate body on frame. And it says here, horsepower of last year's 440 V8 has eased up from 360 to 350. The engine runs more quietly because of fiberglass pads installed under the rocker covers? Huh? Okay, maybe Motor Trend does make the occasional mistake. I think what they mean to say, the fiberglass pad underneath the intake manifold on top of the tin tappet cover, which then would dampen the sound of the intake uh, and then tappets, not in the valve covers. A fiberglass pad in the valve cover would be a good way to pollute the engine. But with that said, let us look inside. Shane, what we'll, what we'll probably do is you'll go around the other side. I'll meet you on the inside. This has some really unusual options. All right, yeah, what we see on this one here is this strange little thing right here. Now, if you own a 58 Cadillac, this will look very familiar. This is the Autotronic Eye, which was something made by GM's guide division, which was their lighting division, but it was sold to Chrysler. This has a, a little sensitivity thing right here. There's a photo cell in the front of this thing that reads oncoming car's headlights and dims your high beams for you so that you don't have to. And again, this is the uh, $45 extra high beam dimmer. Now here's the thing, there was an override switch on these. Now down here on the floor, there's the usual headlight dimmer switch, high beam, low beam, and there's a second switch right there. It's kind of weird, there's two headlight dimmers. Now that one there overrides the Autotronic Eye. So kind of a weird thing, two headlight dimmers. If you had one of these cars and this thing was missing, you might wonder, what the heck, is this a factory error or what is going on? But anyway, the dash on this, strictly high zoot. Again, these are $5,900 cars. The interior panels on these things are far cry from the cardboard found in a Dodge Dart or a Plymouth Valiant. Pressure molded, very nice. Almost looks like leather, it's not, but again, just very, very, you know, high quality interior components. I love how the gas pedal has this chrome uh, facade on it. Just, just cool stuff, you know. And this one does have a radio and, ooh, the glove compartments. Check it out. And I love how these things pop up like that. It's a safety feature instead of coming down. And inside, what have we got? Ooh, -hoo! rat poo poo. Nice. Okay, so let's see. We go here with some kind of a receipt. Let's look in the glove compartment and see what wonders await. Okay, it's an application for title. And this was done in 1981, February, March 17th, 1981. Somebody was registering this car when it probably still had a floor and a trunk floor. And this little hunk of paper right here, no gold coins in this one, but it looks like Charlie, Charlie J. Hiller, Sunoco. Kind of cool. Somebody's kind of got an artistic touch. Maybe it's uh, Charles Schultz. Yeah, Snoopy, probably not. But anyway, this thing here is, uh, again, a four-door hardtop. And how nice this must have been to go down the road and with the top down, or the windows down, I should say, and all that air circulating throughout the inside of the car. Let's continue to the back of this puppy and look at the deck lid where we see the round imperial motif right here with the... Uh, the eagle with its upswept wings. This is an imperial motif that goes back to the 1920s, 1930s right here. Can't open the trunk on this one without prying on it. This is not my car, I'm not gonna mess with it. But again, single exhaust, the only way to fly in 1967. Dual exhaust, a possibility for 68 with the optional 440 um, Magnum or TNT engine. Well, look at this die cast metal on this thing. The curb weight on this car is probably 4,200 pounds, something like that. And uh, the sad thing is these cars are so massive and so, strongly built that they were leaders in the demolition derby game. And here at Burniston Auto Wrecking, Dale's brother, I believe his name's Mike, uh, bought up all the Imperials he could back in the 80s and early 90s with the idea of someday using them in demolition derbies locally. Uh, luckily, Mike you know, didn't get into that. And uh, these Imperials are all over the place here because he bought them for demolition use, you know, because they're so strong. But again, this one here does not have a body on frame construction uh, from the firewall forward, yeah, but underneath here, this is all unitized, like a Belvedere or a Dodge Dart. Stronger and heavier. But again, it was part of Chrysler's move to uh, move the Imperial a little farther away from the expense of building it without shortchanging the vehicle by, ch by sharing this with the Chrysler New Yorker platform. So that's the story of how Elwood Engel and uh, unitized or semi-unitized construction uh, brought Chrysler uh, Imperial closer to Cadillac. Now Cadillac always ran away selling probably six times as many cars as Imperial did, but Imperial was in there trying. So anyway, if you like this video, we're gonna be back with more tomorrow here at Furnace and Auto Wreck. Subscribe to the Steve Mac YouTube channel, give it a thumbs up, and we'll see you tomorrow.